All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online. This is uh, session 16, Renewing the Mind, part 10. We've really, this will be the last one in Renewing the Mind. We'll get into, in, uh, the, we'll finish off in Dwelling Life in January, but this will be the last one for part 10. And let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. And last Sunday, I talked about the divine romance. I talked about how the key to being healed from a root of rejection is to enter into the divine romance, into a bridal relationship with Jesus. And Song of Solomon 8, 6 really captures the, the uh, ultimate expression of the divine romance here. And, and, and I believe Song of Solomon 8, 6 is, is one of the verses in Scripture that shows us that this love story between Solomon and the Shulamite was more than just a love story, but it was actually and a, a meant to be prophetic of the bridegroom Jesus and the bride, the church, their relationship. Um, not everything is meant to be prophetic, but, but there's definitely signs and tokens of that in this, in this uh, book. In Song of Solomon 8, 6, the bridegroom says to the bride, put me like a seal over your heart. Put me like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. And jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. And that really, that last part, the very flame of the Lord. And, and so what we're going to talk about today in, the, in this session is as we talk about being healed of the root of rejection and entering into the divine romance is this the fire of God's love. It's the fire of God's love. It's this Song of Solomon 8, 6. It's, the, it's a jealous, all-consuming love, the very flame of God that ignites in the heart, that sets our heart on fire. And so what we're going to do in this session here is we're going to talk about um, seven expressions of God's love, seven expressions of God's love that will heal us of a root of rejection. So again... We've been talking about this over and over that we will be either trans, we will either be planted in the soil of rejection, and if we're planted in the soil of rejection, we're going to give, uh, we're going to bear fruit of rejection. We talked about the fruit of rejection: rebellion, independence, cynicism, judgmentalism, criticism, all those different things we talked about. We spent so many weeks on talking about if we're trans, if we're planted in the soil of God's, uh, the soil of rejection. We're going to bear the fruit of rejection. But if we're, if we're planted in the soil of God's love, we're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so seven expressions of the love of God that we're going to be talking about today that will transplant us, that will change us, that will move us from rejection and, into love. And so let's start with number one. Is Number one is God's nature is love. And we're talking about seven expressions of God's love. God's nature is love. I love this in 1 John 4, 16, where John, who is the apostle of love, John is the apostle of love. John is the apostle that, that, lit, that was the one, he, I love what he called himself. He said, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. That's so awesome. I love that. And he, he's, he, wrote, he was writing the gospel of John himself. Obviously, he wrote it himself. And he said, when Peter came to him and was questioning about something, and he said, the disciple whom he loved. That's, that was his identity. And even in uh, John chapter 20, John, or John was writing, it says, the one who leaned his head against, on the bosom of Christ. That was his identity. That was John's identity. Is he, he had such a revelation of God's love for him expressed through Jesus Christ. And he wrote in 1 John 4, 16, this one, John, the beloved, who had so much insight, so much revelation. He said, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I love those three words. God is love. He said, in, 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 actually, that was in verse 8. In verse 16, I just read verse 8. Verse 16 says, we have come to know when we have believed the love which God has for us. And he again says it again. God is love. God is love. And this is what I want to just hit on as we talk about seven expressions of God's love. The very nature of God is love. 
For the scriptures to say God is love, it defines the very nature of God. God is love. And what's so interesting about this is the scriptures say God is love, and the scriptures also say God is a consuming fire. So God is a God of love. God's love is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 talks about that where the Lord said, I am a consuming fire, a jealous God. God's love is a consuming fire. God's love is a jealous love. God's love is a fiery love. It's not a Mr. Rogers kind of love, like be nice to everyone. No, if you experience the love of God, it's going to burn everything up in your life that's not like Christ. It is a jealous love for you. It's not like we're going to get along and be neighbors. No, God is coming to take over. Just like we see in the, in the book of Revelation, it says, now the kings of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Jesus Christ is coming to this world to take over. And he's coming into your heart to take over. He's not coming into your heart to be your neighbor. He's coming into your heart to take over. He's coming into your heart to burn you know, we talk about the baptism of fire, and everyone's like, everyone who's in a charismatic church goes, oh, praise God, hallelujah, until you're baptized in fire and your world's turned upside down and you realize, ugh, if I don't know this is the baptism of fire, I may not have wanted this. I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but, but God's fire comes to burn everything in our lives, every allegiance, every trust, everything in our heart, every idol, God would come in and burn those things away so that what is left is a heart consumed with passion for him. That's the love of God. The very nature of God is love. But it's not... Again, it's, it's a holy, jealous love. It's a fiery, passionate love. God is a consuming fire. God is love. And he's coming to take over. He's coming to completely consume our hearts with his love and to baptize our hearts in his love. And that's why I read Song of Solomon 8, 6 to start because that's the very cry of the bridegroom to the church is that you would set me like a seal on your heart and like as a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. It is the very fire of God. It's the fire of the Lord. The Lord wants to ignite his bride with the fire of his love that it would consume the root of rejection and would burn within us such a passion for him. Now, the second one, the second expression of God's love is the father loves the son. Now, you gotta, you got to stick with me on this because this is setting us up for something later. we got to understand the father's love for his son. If we don't understand the father's love for his son, then so much of, of the gospel, so much of what we read in Scripture won't make sense, is we've got to take a step back from where we are today, back into before time and creation, back into the eternity of eternities, back before there was anything created, back before the, there was even a heaven, back before there was even a throne, back before there was the angels, when it was just God and God himself alone in the fellowship of the Trinity. It blows our minds away, but we think about this unapproachable light. God the Father and God the Son bound together by God the Holy Spirit in this beautiful expression of love where for, I don't know how, we, don't, we have no idea how many years there was before he created anything. I'm just going to say billions of years. I have no idea if that's correct, but just to give us a frame of reference, billions of years before anything's created, God the Father and God the Son are in perfect union through, with God the Holy Spirit and they're not bored for one second. I mean, we hear that and like, 
okay, what did they, ta- I mean, what did they talk about? You know, what did they do? I mean, there was no YouTube or TikTok or any of that stuff. Not that you guys listen to TikTok but, or do TikTok, but it just came out of my mouth. But what do you do for like billions of years and they were never bored, they were never lonely, they were perfectly filled with pleasure and joy. That's the relationship between the Father and the Son. And Jesus, when he became a man, when the eternal Son of God was incarnated in the, in the womb of Mary, and he became a man, and he grew up in his ministry, he said that I and the Father are one. That union did not begin after the incarnation. That union was from eternity past, and it was unbroken from eternity past all the way through to the cross. I and the Father are one. Jesus never did anything except that which his Father was saying and doing. Jesus only did what the Father was saying and doing. That union, that unbreakable union, that, 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 that intimacy they had together, for, that was just unbreakable by the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said in John 5, 20, or no, actually John, yeah, either Jesus or John, I'd have to look at it, someone, either Jesus or John, I think it, no, it's actually Jesus. He said, the Father loves the Son, and he shows him all things that he himself is doing. This intimacy between the Father and the Son that spanned all the way back before time and creation where where Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And then we read through the Gospels and you start seeing the Father's passion for his Son. You see in the transfiguration, or you see even at the baptism, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit came down upon him and rested upon him like a dove, and then out of the of the balcony of heaven, the clouds split, and the Father says about his beloved Son, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The pleasure of God wasn't just when he became a man. The pleasure of God stemmed all the way back into eternity past. Even when Jesus was praying um, before this crucifixion, he said to the Father, you loved me before the, before the foundation of the world. We, 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 I mean, words, human words, fail to articulate the intense pleasure and passion the Father has for his beloved Son. Then the Mount of Transfiguration takes place. The disciples go up to the mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before them, and Moses and Elijah appeared, and Peter, of course, wanted to build a tabernacle, three tabernacles for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And the Lord's like... Or even the father's like, Peter, would you be quiet? The father interrupts this incredible experience and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's passion. The the, the passion that the father has for his son whom Jesus has called the beloved Jesus is called his beloved son. The, the, this passionate love for his son just that stems throughout eternity. Jonathan Edwards says that the father, the father has, has infinite happiness or the infinite happiness of the father consists in the enjoyment of his son. See, when, when the father... I just want to read this from the notes here just because I probably can't say it as good as I wrote it. But what is it about the son that fills the father with such joy and delight? It's his perfect balance of infinite majesty and transcendent meekness, the lion and the lamb. It's his radiant glory and his servant-like humility, his exacting justice and his unmerited grace his uncompromising righteousness and his tender mercies, his fear of God and his equality with God, his submission to the Father and his absolute dominion, his self-sufficiency and utter reliance upon God. And so when the Father looked at his son in eternity past and he saw his father, or the Father saw his son and the beauty of his son, The father said, this is my beloved son. 
This is the son of my love in whom I am well pleased. See, it's the lion and the lamb when God sees his son. And here's where I'm getting to, which is point three. Point three. This is what's so incredible. Everything I just described about God's love for his son is a description of his love for you. Because listen to this. These are two verses. I I just want you to memorize these verses. The same way the father loves his son is the same way the father loves you. The same way the father loves the son is the same way Jesus loves you. That's almost, you can't even comprehend. It almost is like, is that really true? sounds like your preacher exaggerating up here. No, it's true. Just look at this in John 17, 23. Jesus is praying to the Father. And he's saying that the world may know that you sent me. And you love them. Catch that. You love them even as you have loved me. That is amazing. That's stunning. The Father loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. That's, I mean, it's almost, it's almost too hard, too good to be true. I mean, it's incredible. John 15, verse 9, Jesus said, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. So we get this this flow of the fire of God's love like a river flowing out. You know, Daniel, when he was taken up into the throne room, he saw a a river of fire. Well, that fire is the fire of God's love. That fire is the overflow. And even like uh, in Revelation, you see that the overcomers, they're worshiping God on the sea of glass mingled with fire. That fire is the fire of God's jealous love. And the bride will be burning and and baptized in that love because the father loves the bride just as much as he loves Jesus. Jesus loves the bride just as much as the father loves him. See, that's talking about you. That's talking about me. Man, that's like a Merry Christmas gift to you. I mean, isn't that incredible that God who burns with holy and jealous fire, burns for you. He loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. That will sever the root of rejection because if the creator of the universe is that much in love with me, who cares what anyone else says about me? I am God's beloved. I am like Daniel, greatly beloved of the Lord. I am like John, the disciple whom he loved. See, this is the the ultimate intention of God is to invite you and to invite me into the very fire of that relationship of the Trinity, that fiery relationship of the Trinity that began in eternity past. God sent his son Not just to be an atonement or or propitiation. Absolutely, he did. But he did it ultimately to bring you and to bring me into this loving relationship. The very relationship God the Father and God the Son have had for all eternity. It's the good pleasure of God to bring you into that relationship. This whole thing is about a relationship with God. It's not about boring, stale religion. It's not about following all these laws and principles and then feeling good about how great you are morally. Now, again, there are laws and commandments, obviously, but I'm talking about this is the divine romance. This is the ultimate intention of God to bring you into the very relationship the Father and the Son shared in eternity past. 
that you would be a bride to the Son. You would be the, the Son being the, the, the source of love. You would be the recipient and the responder of God's love, and you would give that love back to him. And you would be in this relationship with the, with the Father where you would be just like his Son, conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. A corporate Son made of millions of, of men and women who have been conformed by the cross and the Spirit of God into his very image. The Godhead yearns for a relationship with you marked by intimacy, deep conversations, and unending communion through the Holy Spirit. A relationship of pleasure with unbroken union. That is God's desire for you. That is God's heart for you. That is God's love for you, that he would passionately pursue you with that kind of, that kind of desire for you. You are, you are delighted in by him. Number four, God is intimately acquainted with you. I mean, not only is God love, not only does the father love his son, not only does the father love you like he loves his son, not only does Jesus love you like the father loves, his, loves the son, but God is intimately acquainted with all your ways. I, I love Psalm 139, where David, who's such a picture of the bride of Christ, was writing. And he, I'm just going to read through some of these things that he said in Psalms 139. You can go back and, and read it later. But David is writing. He says, you have searched me and you have known me. He says, You've un you understand my thought from afar. In other words, the thought doesn't even come, and you already understand what I'm going to think, and you understand it. God understands what you're going through. God understands your crisis. God understands the trial you're going through. He understands everything you're feeling and experiencing. David said that you scrutinize or you winnow my path. In the jealousy of God, he winnows your path so that you will stay on that straight and narrow way. He knows you're lying down. He said in verse 3, he says, you are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. God is intimately acquainted with all of your ways. God is intimately, he knows everything. He knows every desire you have. He knows every thought you have. He knows everything you're planning to do. He knows your intentions. He knows every single thing about you. He's intimately acquainted with all your ways. And when you are in a relationship with God and he desires you and you desire him, when you're in this bridal relationship with the Lord, what happens is what's important to you is important to him. That's the way, that's the way he works. David says, before there is a word on my tongue, you know it all. You have, you have enclosed me behind and before you've laid your hand on me. Psalm, Psalm 139 Verse 13 through 15, he's talking about, he says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In your book were written the days that were ordained for me when there was not even one of them. In other words, God saw you in eternity past. He formed you in the womb. He made you the way you are. He crafted you. He formed you to be who he wanted you to be in relationship with him. He wrote your days into a book. And Paul mentioned that in Ephesians, that God had a, a plan for you, good works that were, that were prepared beforehand. God had a plan he wrote in his book. David's hitting on the very same thing because of his passion for you, because of his relationship with you, that he marked you, he called you, and he set you apart to live in that plan. The, the fifth thing we see, the fifth expression of the Lord's love for you is the Lord pursues you to be in a relationship with him. The Lord is pursuing you to be in a relationship with him. You, the Lord told the, the disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. If you're in a relationship with God, it's not because one day you woke up and had a brilliant idea and said, I'm going to go seek the God of Israel and know Jesus Christ. See, if you're in a relationship with the Lord, it's because God was pursuing you prior. It's like this in um, Hosea 2.14 when, when Hosea prophesied about Israel at the end of the age. 
Hosea, and this, it, this is true about us, even though we're not Jewish, is, is, even though we're not in, the, you know, in this time yet, the Lord said, therefore, behold, I'm going to persuade her. I'm reading from the New American Standard 2020 version. Therefore, behold, I'm going to, I'm going to persuade her. And I'm going to bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. See, God's heart is a, is a heart of persuasion. God has given you free will. There's, there's, there's this massive debate about, has God, get, you know, is God sovereign or does God, has God given us free will? And God absolutely has given us free will. God does not want robots. He wants lovers. But God is pursuing you. God is a lover persuading you. He's, he's putting things into your heart. He's moving on your heart so that you will, in your free will, respond back to him. And, and because love could not be love if it was coerced. Love could not be love. Only, it's only love if it's voluntary. And so God's working to woo and to persuade out of his passionate love for you into a relationship with him. He persuades you. He moves you. See, if you're born again and you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it's because he's pursuing you and he wooed you and he persuaded you and he revealed himself to you. And then you one day finally said yes. Yes. See, Jesus said in John 6, that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We can't just one day say, I'm going to go seek him in my own power. No, Jesus is saying, you can't even come to me unless I draw you first. So if you're here today, if you're watching online and, and you have any inclination, any desire for God, it's because God himself was pursuing you beforehand. And he's drawing you to himself. He's persuading you. He's moving on your heart to be in this relationship with God the Father and God the Son through God the Holy Spirit and this eternal relationship God desires. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I love this. I have loved you with an everlasting love. What does that mean? His love goes back into the eternal counsels. His love goes back into eternity past before time and creation. His love for you is eternal. And because of this eternal love I have for you, what do he say? I have drawn you with loving kindness. See, God's heart is to draw you. God's heart is to pursue you. God's heart is to woo you. God's heart is to persuade you, to allure you into this relationship with him of free will that you would love him just like the father loves the son. Exodus 19, verse 4, the Lord spoke to Israel and he says, you know what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. See, that's what God has done through Jesus Christ. If you're born again, if you're seeking God, it's because God has worked in your heart prior because of his love for you. David said in Psalm 65, verse 4, How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We can't, again, if, if we have this desire in our heart to pursue the Lord and to be intimate with the Lord and to be in his presence and to be a priest who ministers to him, whose ministry is first vertical, if that's, what, if that's what's in our heart, it's because God chose you to draw you near. If you have any desire in your heart, it's because God chose you and put desires in your heart for him. See, God's love is a love, or God's, God's nature is love. God the Father loves his son. God the Father loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Jesus loves you just as much as the Father loves him. God is pursuing you with passion to be in that relationship with him. And number six, 
You are the Lord's beloved and chosen. I love, let's, let's read 1 Thessalonians 1.4. 1 Thessalonians 1.4 where Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and he says, knowing brethren, beloved by God. I love it. Knowing brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Just, just read, think about that for yourself. Put your name there. Knowing Brian, beloved of God, his choice of you. Knowing Larry, Beloved of God, his choice of you. You look shocked, Larry. He's chosen you. He's chosen us. He's, he's, he calls you beloved. Like, like Daniel, you are greatly beloved of the Lord. You are chosen. He's chosen you. He's chosen you. You've chosen him. He's chosen you. But he chose you first. And you, out of your free will, made a decision to say yes to his pursuit of you. And number seven, expressions of God's love. The Lord desires to be in you. The Lord desired to be in you for you to live by his life. We're going to open this up here in, in a minute, just, but I want to start with 1 John 4, 9. In other words, John's, if you read John's writing in 1 John, several times he says, by this is love, by this is love, by this is love. In other words, he wants to show people this is God expressing his love. And he says, basically saying, this is how God expresses his love for you. He says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. By this, the love of God was revealed in us. In other words, what John's trying to say is, is this is how God shows you, this is how you know God loves you, is he sent his only begotten son into the world. That's the Christmas story. That's the incarnation. That's the birth of Jesus. God, from eternity past, sent his son into the world. Why? So that we might live through him. That's indwelling life. So what, what John is saying is God Desire, the Lord from eternity past, the eternal purpose of God is for Christ to be in you. From eternity past, God had a plan that he worked out in time that of his creation, out of his eternal love for you, he would draw you by his loving kindness so he could put his, his very life, his very presence inside of you. The third person of the Trinity who united the Father and the Son in intimacy in eternity past now dwells in your human spirit. Your human spirit is now touching the very person of the Trinity. He's grafted to your human spirit. And he did this, John saying, God did this because he loved you, because he wanted to be in a relationship with you. And he did this so that you would live by his life. See, there's something about death. And you're talking about the cross. There's something about death when, when people are dying is they say things that are deep, deep in their heart that maybe have not surfaced up before. And we see in John 17, this very scenario where the Lord is going to the cross. Death is imminent. And he's praying to his father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. Father, the very love that you have might be in them. But I love what he said in John 17, 26, to, to end that phrase, the Lord said that I would be in them. That's passion. That's love. That Jesus Christ, just, I don't know if it's exactly moments, but very, the, the cross is imminent. He reaches back into eternity past. 
into the eternal counsels of God, and he's burning with love. And he says, Father, that I would be in them. What incredible love that is. What incredible love that is. Hebrews 12, 2 talks about, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What is that joy set before him? You are the joy set before him. He endured the cross so he could be in a relationship with you. To be, to have a bride that would receive his love and love him back. To have a bride that would dwell in communion and intimacy with him. To have a bride that would burn with the father's very own passion. To have a bride that would be conformed into his very image. That was the joy set before him. And he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God so that now, through the Holy Spirit, he could plant his very life into you so you could live by his life. That is the divine romance. That is the lover of God, that the love of God pursuing you to be in a relationship with you. We talk about the incarnation during Christmas. But the bridegroom in eternity past said, I will go, send me, Father. I will go be the sacrifice. And so the eternal Son of God wrapped himself in human flesh, came to this earth through the womb of Mary, incarnated to, to bear the, the shame of the cross and to be with us. He tabernacled among us because God was pursuing his bride. God was pursuing you and me. God was pursuing us. Jesus, the eternal son, was pursuing us because he wanted to be in us and for us to be in this very union of life, this very union of relationship, the father and the son shared in eternity past. The eternal plan of God drove him to the cross, drove him to the incarnation so his very life could be planted in you so that divine life could now be put in us so that we could be of his nature and be the wife of the lamb. That is the divine romance. That is, that is the eternal purpose of God. God loves you so much that he wants to be in you. God loves you so much that he wants you to rely and to depend on his life so that you would burn with that kind of passion for him. See, what an incredible love God has for you. What an incredible love God has for you. I, I want to, as we bring this message to a close, I just want to turn, let's turn to John, <clears throat> John chapter 17. I encourage you to read this chapter if you've just, I mean, you, you really can't ever exhaust the depths of this chapter. It's an incredible chapter. But John 17, verse, verse 22, Jesus is, again, the very issues of his heart are bubbling to the surface. And he's saying to the Father, Lord, the glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them. You see it right there. His passion to be in a people. I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. That's the passion of the bridegroom. He goes in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory. We talked about that last week, that part of the divine romance is beholding the beauty of God, is beholding what the angels looked at for, for, for however many years, worshiping the Son of God in incredible worship, as they said, holy, holy, holy is the one who sits on the throne. Holy is he. That very glory that you have given me, and this brings us back into eternity past, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. 
the passion of the Father for his Son. And Jesus said, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and I will make it known to them that the love with which you loved me may be in them. In other words, what Jesus is saying, that I would have a bride who has Song of Solomon 8.6 burning in their heart, the very love of the Father, the very passionate love of the Father from eternity past, setting apart, setting ablaze the heart of the bride that we would love Jesus the same way the Father has loved him. That was the heart beat of Jesus Christ. And as we go into a new year, 2024, this is always, always one at the very top of the list that God would have a people in this next year who would grow in this passion for him. That God would have a people, that we would be a people that grow in this passion for the Lord. That we would love him. We would love Christ the way the Father has loved him. And we would be so in love with him, we would have such passion for him that everything that hinders first love would be burned away by the jealous fire of God that we would be on the sea of glass for all eternity worshiping him before the throne, burning with the very fire of God that has mingled that sea of glass before the throne, the overcomers with a harp in one hand singing the song of the Lamb and the song of Moses, the victory of God on that sea of glass, burning with consuming fire. That the very heart and love of God would burn in you. And he says, and he ends this prayer, I love it. And I in them. I in them. He went to the cross and despised the shame so I could be in them. Christ in you. Christ in you. Your spirit, if you're born again, your spirit literally is touching Christ. Your spirit is literally touching God, the third person of the Trinity. He's grafted to your human spirit so that your spirit and the Holy Spirit are never disconnected. You're always connected. Meaning that you don't have to run here, there, and everywhere to experience the presence of God. Some people think they got to go to this place or that place or this conference or that conference or this prayer room or whatever to find God. It's like, no. I mean, I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying... But we're, we're running to all these places trying to find God, and the Lord's like, no, I'm in you. Why don't you just stop for 30 minutes and learn how to connect with God inside of you instead of trying to run here, there, and everywhere to find God? Why don't you look here to find him inside of you and learn how to have that relationship and that communion with him that he wants, that he longs for? So many Christians have this old covenant paradigm that God resides in this building or that building or this conference or that conference or this minister or that minister. Again, it doesn't mean we don't go to church. We, we've got to have the ecclesia, but I'm trying to say is if you're born again, your spirit and the Holy Spirit, they are one. God, Jesus Christ loves you so much and pursued you with such passion and drew you to himself so he could be in you. You have, you are the temple of God. You have the holy of holies within you. You can go into inwardly and meet with him and have a holy of holies relationship with him every single day. You can hear the word of the Lord every single day. I tell you this, if he's in you and he's called the word of God, He's not remaining silent. He's going to speak to you if you believe. He's going to speak to you if you desire. He will speak every single day. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. 
The manna that the children of Israel experienced was only a prophetic picture of the way we are meant to live in communion with God who dwells inside of us. Is that you can go inwardly and you can know in your spirit through your divine knower, your spirit has that ability, that divine ability to know what he's speaking and what he's saying so that you have access to the very mind of Jesus Christ. Wow. We have the mind of Christ. Why are we living so soulish? Why are we living in such unbelief? We have the mind of Christ. We can know the very thoughts of God's heart. Take an hour, take 30 minutes and get familiar every day with that, this inward voice of God. Like Isaiah 55 says, come to me, incline your ear and come to me. That's the way we need to approach our relationship with God. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. What gets in our way often is unbelief. It gets, it gets in our way. We just don't believe he's going to speak to us. We don't even... A lot of us don't even believe he lives inside of us. And when we have unbelief, we don't have the faith of a child, then God is not going to speak to us because he can't speak in unbelief. Come to him with faith. Come to him with belief that God wants to speak to you and he will speak to you and listen so your soul may live. Sometimes... Sometimes God dries up familiar avenues of the way you used to pursue him to bring you into a greater inward relationship with you. Like, for example, when I was younger, I, 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 the only way I could really experience God was to get in my car and go on a drive for about an hour and listen to worship music. And, I, and the Lord met me there. And that lasted for years and years and years. But over time, that began to dry up because God wanted, and I'm not, again, I'm not, I still do that some and it's still great, but I don't do that every day like I used to. Now God's trained me to go inward to meet with him. Lord, what is it you're saying? Lord, what is it you're speaking? Man must live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. What is the word of the Lord for today? Like Samuel, listen. Like, like, uh, like Eli told Samuel, listen. Or like Samuel told the Lord, Lord, here I am. Speak to me. Is that we could come into that place of, of intimacy with the Lord, of hearing his voice and communing with him. And so as we just wrap this up, seven expressions of God's love to be in this relationship with you that heals you from rejection. It transplants you from the root of rejection and plants you into the soil of God's love so that his love might fill and permeate every part of you and the fruit you produce would be the fruit of the spirit that comes out of this union with him. Amen. Father, we just pray right now. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, I feel this for myself. A, a fresh stirring of the Holy Spirit into greater intimacy and greater communion. And I just have noticed, even myself, where I got into unbelief or I got into busyness and I was not hearing you like I was and how you just... just lovingly, you know, challenge me on that. Well, I just pray for every one of us, God. I, I just believe, I just believe, just as you're listening, just over the Christmas break, I just sense that it just seems like when you, that if you will take time without an agenda just to draw near to the heart of God, that he will speak to you things you don't know. I'm not saying he's going to give you, you know, again, Prophetic, what's the Lord saying for 2024? You know, a lot of those times, those things don't ever happen. I'm talking about just as we head into 2024, Lord, what are you saying as we head into a new year? And I just believe that if you will really set apart 
this time, you know, a lot of us have breaks. And if you don't have breaks, but, you know, it's, it's different. But if the, 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 the extra time you have, if you will set that time apart just to be, to, to be alone with the Lord with no agenda, but, but Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what are you speaking? Just recultivating that relationship, God will speak. God will show you things you do not know. God will say things to you you had no idea was there. And, and just begin, begin to write those things down and really just begin to inscribe those things. Write them down and, and just inquire of him. As we, as we head into this new year, Lord, we pray. Let us have those ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, let us come into that union with you. Lord, let us come into that communion with you. Lord, that we could hear the voice of God. It's like, it's like Isaiah chapter 6. Is, is Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Uzziah was one that was blessed of God, and it was, a lot of Israel put their trust in him. He was the key to the breakthrough. He was the key to the move of God. He was the, cre- the key to Israel becoming what it was meant to be. But when he died, when his heart got lifted up in pride and he fell, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. And it was then when Isaiah saw the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and he began to unfold the ultimate prophetic destiny of the nation of Israel. They thought it was just only limited to being blessed, you know, blessed with prosperity, having victory over their enemies and things like that. And God's like, no, it's way bigger than that. This is talking about the millennial kingdom and even in, in, into the new Jerusalem. And it was when Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. And I just believe as we're heading into this new year that things we have trusted in, things that we have put our trust in have been shaken and it's kind of left, I'm sure it left Israel in the place of disillusionment, but it's probably left us in a place of disillusionment where we trusted in this, we trusted in that, we trusted in these systems, we trusted in these things and that trust failed us and it's when those things died Isaiah saw the Lord. I believe that God is bringing the church into a new... I, I believe, the, I believe the, that God is going to purify the prophetic ministry. God is going to purify the prophetic ministry. And that, that he's, he's wanting to speak. He's wanting to bring the separation of the soul from the spirit. He's wanting to separate the personalities and the charisma and the soul of man from the pure word of God. And he wants to speak. I believe as we're heading into 2024, the word of the Lord is being stirred prophetically. The word of the Lord is being stirred prophetically. God is raising up messengers. God is raising up a forerunner ministry. God is raising up John the Baptist vessel that is going to prepare the way of the Lord. Whether you're a speaker, whether you're an intercessor, whatever it is, whatever role or function you have, I believe God wants to stir that in your heart. Stir that afresh in your heart. There's a stirring of the Lord, I believe God wants to bring about. A fresh stirring. So I just pray that right now, Lord. I I pray that right now, Lord, that there would be a fresh stirring in the heart as we head into this, into this Christmas season. Lord, we, we have just felt in our family that this is going to be the best Christmas ever. Lord, I, I pray that. I pray that we would have an incredible, I pray everyone would have the, was such a blessed Christmas, Lord. Lord, experiencing the, the fellowship with friends and family, but ultimately even greater, experiencing that fellowship with you, I pray. So bless, I pray, those who desire, Lord, to have the best Christmas ever in experiencing ultimately with you, hearing your voice, Lord, just, just, sit, just getting away, breaking away, and hearing the Lord speak.
There's a stirring of that. If you feel as if it's been dry or dead, if you feel as if it's been kind of stale, there's, there's a stirring there. There's a fresh stirring there. Just want to encourage you to pursue the Lord. And I just also feel like the Lord is saying that the joy of the Lord is your strength. If, if, if you feel as if you have hit this place of whether it's depression or whether it's sadness and you can't break through, it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. It's not about you having joy. It's about the Lord having you and putting his joy in your heart. It's not about you being happy. It's about the Lord who is joy filling you and possessing you. And so much of the joy comes. It's like John the Baptist said. He said, the, 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 bride, the bridegroom has the bride, but the friend of the bridegroom hear his, hears his voice, and this joy of mine has been made full. I just want to pray for those who might be struggling with whether it could be depression, sadness, because the, the circumstances around you have changed or are being shaken. I just want to pray for those um, that you would come into this place of like John the Baptist, the friend of the bridegroom, stands and hears him, and this joy of mine has been made full. That, that the external... I mean, John was in a wilderness. <laughs> think about that. So we, we think about our circumstances and we think, okay, joy is dictated by our circumstances, but John the Baptist was in a wilderness eating locust, having to wear camel's hair. <laughs> I mean, that does not sound, that sounds miserable. Yet John the Baptist said, this joy of mine has been made full. He was, he was feasting on the bridegroom's voice. I believe there's a fresh stirring right now of intimacy to hear the bridegroom's voice that's going to stir up the joy of the Lord that's going to break through sadness and depression and gloominess and heaviness. So I pray that right now, Lord, if that's you, just receive. Lord, I pray that, that heaviness and gloom, Lord, and sadness and depression in Jesus' name would be removed, Lord. And God, you would bring a breakthrough, Lord, a breakthrough of joy that comes by hearing the bridegroom's voice. Let us hear the bridegroom speak. Let us hear the bridegroom speak. Lord, I'm praying for those who would listen online, those who would listen to in person. I'm praying for us, Lord, that as we head into this new year, that the word of the Lord would come to us. There would be seasons of visitation. There would be seasons of visitation. The visitation of God would come, I pray, for a fresh stirring of the Lord. I just pray that you would open that door, Lord, for us. Lord, you would open that door for us to come up here, so to speak, like John, and to know the things that will take place. We thank you, Lord. Just, just receive. Just, Lord, fill us with your spirit right now. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. just want to say to those listening online, this will be our last. Now, we'll have one, another service will stream on the 31st. But anyway, I hope you have an awesome Christmas. And we'll uh, be back on the 31st, New Year's Eve day. And so, anyway, 